and welcome to episode 79 of Real Life Ghost Stories. How you do? To kick things off this week, we need to thank our newest Patreon subscribers. We would like to thank Karis Spencer, Zachary Myers, Imogen Phillips, Jamie B, Laura Jane, Guy Buttersnaps, Bernadette Scar Sella, yeah. yeah. Paisley Noir, Tamerlin, Zoe Reap, Jaden McTaggart, Nancy Eastill, Marie Phillips, Ariel Gabrielle Millon. Million. <laughs> it's very small. Agata, oh no. Um, Agata Kiwatkowska. That's not bad, is it? Kiwatkowska? Yeah. Kiwatkowska? I don't know. Agata. Ella Flood. Esmeralda Soriano. Sarah Bruin. Adam West. Mossman. Tante. Amanda Claire Gardner. Oh, that was a really bad one. That was as bad as we've done in a long time, I think. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Patreon subscribers. I feel bad. But thank you. We appreciate you as always. And we also have some key worker shout outs today. Or a key worker shout out. Oh, sorry. A key worker <laughs> shout out today. <laughs> um, so we've been trying to just give another recognition to key workers all around the world. And just say thank you for what you're doing. And today's little shout out goes to Alex Coots, who is an emergency medical doctor in Camden, New Jersey. And you were nominated by your wife, Francesca. So thanks, Alex, for everything you do and for the rest of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So our film review this week. Our film review is Extraordinary. Extraordinary was released in 2019. It has 6.4 out of 10 on IMDb and 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. Would you like a synopsis? Yes. A woman who has supernatural abilities must save a possessed girl. Though driving instructor Rose has a love-hate relationship with her abilities, she decides to help Martin and his daughter Sarah. So what were your thoughts on this film? Um, I think the focus should be on the word extra in the title because it's a little bit extra. (laughs) It is a little bit extra, this film. It also goes to show how pointless Rotten Tomatoes is as a gauge to suggest that it's 98% good is insane. (laughs) I have to say, now this might alarm some listeners. I think you better sit down. It's not something I talk about openly, but I am actually Irish. No way. I know. I know I've kept it a secret for this long. And I just bloody love to champion Irish films and especially Irish horror films because they're few and far between. And this is like a paranormal parody. It's not really like a, a a horror as such. And I just wasn't a massive fan of it. I'm sorry. I've let my country down. I can never go back. It was kooky. It was definitely kooky. Like it was different. Didn't dislike it. It was funny. It was definitely funny in places. It's just a bit, I don't know. I don't know what it was about it either. It wasn't amazing. No, it wasn't. I thought there were some amazing one-liners, like really funny one-liners. And I thought that the idea of everyday ordinary hauntings was really funny, like all the different hauntings that they explore. I didn't, I didn't like the whole, there, there's, so you find out at the very beginning that this girl, Rose, um, is, is able to talk to the dead and she's had a hand somehow in killing her dad, who was like a, 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 a medium and a, and a paranormal investigator so obviously that's her trauma and that follows her through life and she gave it all up to become a driving instructor i really disliked the there was a there's a storyline of satanists in it and i really disliked the way the satanist was portrayed and his wife i didn't find it funny at all what, that's what you're taking offense at <laughs> yeah i really didn't find it funny I was like, I don't get why. Okay, that's that side bored me a little bit. Well, sorry, that that wasn't. <laughs> I just didn't find it funny. I mean, I, I know that you like to stand up for groups of people, but I've not heard you stand up for Satanists before. That's quite an interesting take. No, is it? No, I don't mean as in I found it offensive or I thought it was that's inappropriate. That's what you sounded like. No, that's not what I mean. I just didn't find it funny. I just didn't. I didn't. I maybe it wasn't well written that particular side story. I don't know. I just wasn't. I wasn't a massive fan of this film. There was two things that I really liked about this film. The first one is I loved the soundtrack. It was just. It was just very different for a film, and I, and it worked really well, and I liked it. And that was a big plus point for me. 
the second plus point was uh, one of the first ghosts they visit was uh, <laughs> was haunting the green bin. Yeah, and it turned out to be her dead husband who had an issue about her not using the green bin properly, which I thought was quite amusing. Because um, I'd imagine that's the kind of thing that you'd haunt me about. Well, this is what we said. I mean, maybe I'm maybe I didn't like it because it it you know was was too real for me because there was a man haunted by his wife who was you know basically still still telling him what to do from the afterlife and i and i could feel that you know <laughs> and i said when when she when she, their story came on i was like that's me that's me when i die smoking fags yeah generally being annoying <laughs> that's me <laughs> yeah so maybe it's just a bit too close to home maybe that's why you didn't resonate with it maybe um, it was oh can i reiterate that that fag in in uh, britain and ireland is a cigarette, cigarette just um for american listeners and the the actor of the of the love interest and the main man character Martin Martin yeah Martin Martin you're right he was quite good at when he was being possessed by various different forms at changing his face and acting in a slightly yeah different way. I thought he was really good well. um, but yeah it, well, it didn't overwhelm me but I didn't hate it I know I didn't hate it either and the lead the leading lady is Maeve Higgins and she I thought her character was really good but I don't know what it was about the whole film something just missed the mark for me I could listen to people talk in a cork accent. 24 Forever. hours a day it's so upbeat like even when they're delivering dark lines it's upbeat <laughs> i love it so what would you give this film out of five two and a half i'm gonna give it a three at <laughs> a, what, sorry? a what sorry a what sorry i'm gonna give it a three uh because i just have to because I, I desperately wanted to love this film and i just didn't so i'm sorry I feel like I, I do feel like I've let my country down. I'd also like to take this uh, apology to uh, this chance to apologise to uh, Paul Carter, who asked me for a film recommendation um, because he didn't know what to watch. And I said, "Well, we're watching this film this week," and he watched it before us. And I feel like had he listened to this episode before he watched that yeah, film, he potentially not. wouldn't have watched it. So I apologise for wasting your evening. <laughs> well, this episode has begun with apologies, and it shall continue. <laughs> it shall continue that way. Our story this week. When I was a kid, I had a book. And I don't know if it was a book about the paranormal or if that was just a section of this book. Is it the same book that... What the fuck is in this book had? No, it's not the same book. I did think it was for a while, but it actually isn't. And in this book, there was a section, potentially just a section about the paranormal. And this story was in the paranormal section. A very tiny extract from this story. And I was fascinated by the idea of this story. And we have covered some dark, horrific things on this podcast. Like Skinwalkers, Dear David, that Japanese hand story. I mean, horrific stuff. But nothing compares to this story. So you need to buckle up. Are you ready? Not now you've given me that intro. This story begins in 1913 on the Isle of Man. An island on the Irish Sea between Great Britain and Ireland, famed for its natural beauty and its tailless cats. What is not so commonly celebrated about the Isle of Man is something much darker, much more violent and much stranger. Jim Irving and his family lived in Dorlish Cashin, a small farm that was barely enough to sustain them. Jim was a well-educated man and had worked for many years as a travelling piano salesman in England. The farm on the Isle of Man was his retirement, a place to get away from the hustle and bustle of life and spend the autumn of his years in a quiet and peaceful idyllic world close to nature. Jim lived on the farm with his wife Margaret and their daughter Voiry. Life was perhaps not the tranquil paradise that Jim had envisioned. The farm was isolated and lacked electricity or even a telephone. They struggled to make ends meet. On the 13th of September 1931, Jim began his chores around the farm. If you've lived on a farm, you will know that the list of jobs is endless and it is far from an easy life. This morning was different, however, 
and would prove to be the morning that changed Jim Irving's life. In the yard, Jim was confronted with a small, weasel-like creature. Not unusual for the location, but small, weasel-like creatures are not known to alternate between barking like a dog and meowing like a cat. Jim was stunned and entirely bemused. He decided to test this odd little creature and was amazed when he realised it was an almost perfect mimic. Jim began to make the sounds of other barnyard animals and the creature would sound them right back at him. So bizarre were their circumstances that Jim chose to just accept what he was seeing and hearing. The creature soon found its way into the household and the family were plagued by scratching, banging and scrabbling coming from within the walls of their house. Initially, Jim did not connect these sounds to the mysterious creature in the farmyard, but he soon realised that it was when he growled at the scratching within the walls and the creature doing the scratching growled right back at him. The scratching soon escalated into that same mimicry that Jim had heard that fateful morning. And further still, the creature would soon make specific animal sounds on command. As though the creature was learning, it began to babble like an infant, trying to speak, and was able to mimic nursery rhymes that Voiry would sing to it. Voiry was completely fascinated by this creature. And in teaching it nursery rhymes, she inadvertently taught the creature how to speak. The family had been referring to it as Jack. But as his ability to speak improved, the creature firmly told the family that his name was Jeff. Even taking the time to spell it out. G-E-F. Jeff told the family that he was born in New Delhi in India in 1852 and had been brought to the Isle of Man some 20 years earlier when mongoose were introduced to the island to try and combat the growing rabbit population. Jeff informed the family that he was always able to understand human speech, but when Jim and Voiry began speaking to him, it unlocked his ability to communicate with humans. Jeff's newfound ability to speak sparked a plethora of other activity in and around the household, which seemed to spread throughout the island. It started with bangs and raps that Jeff would be able to produce simultaneously from all over the house. This progressed to Jeff throwing items at the Irving family and visitors to the household. He would launch missiles at unsuspecting victims through cracks in the panelling. And then there was the singing. Jeff would sing and chant in songs that were unknown to the family or guests of the house. He would swear in a way that was both shocking and sometimes amusing to the family, using words and phrases that they were not familiar with. Jeff claimed to have the ability to travel all over the island and would apparently spy on neighbours and repeat their conversations and secrets to the Irvings. The Irvings said that Jeff communicated to them that he was an extra clever mongoose, an earthbound spirit, and a ghost in the form of a mongoose. And he once said, I am a freak, I have hands and I have feet, and if you saw me you would faint, you would be petrified, mummified, turned into stone or a pillar of salt. The Irvings made various claims about Jeff. He supposedly guarded their house and informed them of the approach of guests or any unfamiliar dog. They said that if someone had forgotten to put out the fire at night, Jeff would go down and stop the stove. The Irvings claimed that Jeff would also wake people up when they overslept. And whenever mice got into the house, Jeff supposedly assumed the role of the cat, although he preferred to scare them rather than kill them. The Irvings said that they gave Jeff biscuits, chocolates and bananas and food was left for him in a saucer suspended from the ceiling which he took when he thought no one was watching. The Irvings claimed the mongoose regularly accompanied them on trips to the market but always stayed on the other side of the hedges 
chatting incessantly. But he could be violent. You don't know what damage or harm I could do if I were roused. I could kill you all, but I won't. And he would proclaim godlike talents. I'll split the atom. I am the fifth dimension. I am the eighth wonder of the world. Jeff himself was unsure of his form or powers, sometimes claiming to have magical abilities or clairvoyance, which required some form of invisible technology. Once when Margaret asked him about her husband's long absence, Jeff responded, I don't know. I've not got my magic phones on. These continued pranks and strange antics made Jim question whether Jeff was maybe more than just an extra clever mongoose. Irving began to become convinced that Jeff was also a shapeshifter. In a letter, he wrote, Early in 1932, my daughter and I were alone in the house, broad daylight, and I chanced to look through the window of the room we were in, and I saw, to my surprise, a very large cat striped like a tiger. We ourselves did not possess a cat, and I called Voiry to come to the window to look at it. She did so, and remarked on the size of the cat, but more especially, the unusually large bulldog head it had. The cat then walked away from the door of the outbuilding where it was standing, 40 to 50 feet away from us, and I then saw that it was a Manx tailless cat, and I was more than a little surprised, as the pure Manx cat is usually smaller than the English. I thought, this is no ordinary cat, so I slipped a cartridge into my single barrel gun, and I took to go after him. Personally, I am very fond of cats, and do not kill for killing's sake. The cat was a little ahead of me, but easily within range, and it turned through an open gate into a grass field. I was there a few seconds behind, and fully expected to see the cat, but no cat could be seen. Looked as I liked, the field was level. There was not a bush or any roughness where he could have hidden, and the hedges, as they are called here. I detailed my experience to my wife on her return that night, when Jeff called out. It was me you saw, Jim. Further explanation is beyond me. Word spread of this strange man-weasel of Dorlish Cashin, and paranormal investigators began to visit the farmhouse in the hope of catching a glimpse, or more excitingly, having a conversation with Jeff. In 1932, Captain James MacDonald, who was a friend of psychic researcher Harry Price, arrived on the island to investigate the phenomenon. MacDonald visited the island three times between 1932 and 1953, and though he never actually saw Jeff, he heard him speak a number of times and also witnessed a bottle and a china tray being thrown without any discernible source. This was enough to warrant a visit from Henry Price and Richard Stanton Lambert of the BBC. Prior to their arrival, Jeff had confided in the Irvings that he would not be seen or heard in front of Price and Lambert, as Price was a doubter, and therefore he would be invisible and silent for the duration of their visit. In 1937, Nandor Fodor, research officer for the International Institute for Psychical Research, arrived on the Isle of Man in order to spend an intensive week studying the Jeff phenomenon. True to form, Jeff refused to appear for Fodor, but Fodor still viewed the case as a true mystery, since all the probabilities are against it, but all of the evidence is for it. After Fodor visited the farm, Jeff became quiet and, according to Voiry, disappeared for longer and longer periods of time. Jim Irving died in 1945 and the remainder of the Irving family moved away to England. In 1947, Leslie Graham, a retired army lieutenant who had bought the farm, reported to have shot and killed Jeff. When Voiry was shown a picture of the apparent corpse of Jeff, she stated that it definitely was not him. In a 1970 interview with Fate magazine, 
Voiri insisted that Jeff was real, but that she wished it had never happened. Footprints, stains on the wall, hair samples, all claimed to be evidence of Jeff, were identified as actually belonged to the Irving Sheepdog. And there were several photos which were claimed by the Irvings to depict Jeff. So what are your thoughts on this? That's the darkest insane. story we've ever covered. It's an insane story. <laughs> Have you ever heard it before? Uh, only on the quiz. Yeah, Kev so this did. was this was inspired by Kev from We Need to Talk About Ghosts Paranormal Quiz. He did a question about Jeff the Mongoose and I was like, oh shit, that story. He did. She actually said that. That's verbatim. Obviously, I did, next yeah. to her when Kev was reading the question out. I just want to put it out here right now that I bought a book about this story and read it did you yes <laughs> and uh one chapter was all that was based on jeff okay what's in the rest of it then i don't know i didn't read the rest no. of it it's all about other talking animals but no. the book was called um is it roger kipling's just so stories because that's not real no it's okay. a book called jeff the talking mongoose eighth wonder of the world by a guy called i think it's his name is like tim schwartz maybe Hang on, I'm going to scroll down. Uh, Jeff the Talking Mongoose, Eighth Wonder of the World by Tim or Schwartz. And I got it on the Kindle, just so you know. Well, I would like to dispute that title instantly because everybody yep. knows that the Eighth Wonder of the World is in fact, or was in fact, Andre the Giant. Very true. So. <clears throat> Already we've spotted a big plot big hole plot in this story. Hole. Big plot hole. So our mongoose, I need, the first thing I need to know is our mongoose is on the Isle of Man thing. Because they're not in the wild in this country. I think they were genuinely a thing. I don't think that's... um, So it's not bizarre that there's a mongoose. It's bizarre that it's a talking mongoose. Yes, Because if there was a mongoose in like Canterbury, that would be bizarre. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is the plural of mongoose, mongoose? Good question. Now there's a question for you. That's the real mystery. It's a bizarre story, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I don't don't really know what to say about it. Do you want to go through some theories? Yes, give me some theories. So I've got, I came up with four theories as I was reading. Okay. You came Uh, up with these. I did, yeah. Nice. And they're based on little bits of the story that I read and then thought, if I add that in, it ruins the story, you know? So, theory number one. It was Voiry. Apparently, she was really good at mimicking animals. That's cool. So a friend, a school friend of hers was interviewed, I think it was in like 2001, and she said, oh, that they, that Voyeur used to entertain them all in school by, like, doing impressions of animals. She was reportedly able to throw her voice. Now, ventriloquism isn't about the ability to throw your voice. It's about the ability to speak without physically demonstrating that you're speaking. Like, that, there is a difference. And she, Voyeur, has always claimed that it was not her. She always claimed that Jeff was real. Jeff was particularly interested in Voiry. Um, so at one point, Voiry moved and slept in her parents' bedroom because she was so frightened of Jeff. And the, Jeff apparently screamed around the house, you can take her wherever you like, but you're never going to be able to hide her from me. So, theory one, it was actually Voiry. So you can, you can throw in your voice as a thing, though, right? I don't know to what extent... You can throw your like voice. If you speak into your hands and then trap the sound and then throw it, it'll it come it'll out somewhere else. Come out wherever it lands. Yeah. yeah, pretty sure that doesn't work. Okay. Um Yes, except I feel like if it was her, her dad wouldn't need to buy into it quite as much as he did. Because he told that whole story about stalking a cat, didn't he, at one point with a the shotgun. There was that so the reason as well I didn't pay much heed on the photos is because like <laughs> This isn't funny, but in some of the photos, it's like, here's Jeff pretending to be a cat. And it's a cat. <laughs> and it's just a fucking yeah. cat. <laughs> um, although, one thing that does give a little bit of credence to your um, to your theory, that theory, is that the way that Jeff spells his name would be a misspelling for a kid. Because what you spell Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, really, don't you? Or, or J-E-F-F. J-E-F-F. Yeah. So it would be potentially a misspelling. But the, I mean, the story that Jeff gives is brilliant. I was born in New Delhi in 1952. 
somebody brought me over to definitely, hunt the rabbits. Definitely wasn't 1952, didn't or it? Or 1852, <laughs> sorry. So what are your thoughts? I mean, we can come back. You can choose your favourite theory at the end. Yeah. So theory number two, which was widely believed initially by people like, so Ford, Ford or, for example, the really famous um, psychical researcher, his first impression was, yeah, this is a poltergeist. So... Jeff is a poltergeist. The reason why. Loves a bit of banging on walls. I was going to leave that there and I decided not to. I don't know. I actually don't know anything about Jeff's sex life. So I can't comment on that. Knocking on walls. Mimicry. Throwing shit. I literally wrote down throwing shit. I obviously got bored with this theory. Very, very quickly. Um, The things like uh, shouting and swearing. And and all those things that poltergeists are famous for. They're almost like football hooligans. Yeah, pretty much. There's a lot of there's a lot of banging that goes on in the football hooligan community. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's think about this for a second. They are very common traits of poltergeistism, if that's a word. Well, it is now. So it's a strong theory. The problem is, what is the point of the mongoose? If he's a poltergeist, why is he knocking around? Yeah, why is he a mongoose? I was going to say banging a mongoose, but that wasn't really what I was going Well, with. listen, uh, things are going weird. Why is he knocking around in a mongoose? He doesn't need to, does he? Most people guys don't bother possessing anything. They use all their energy to launch stuff and shout and do various other things. Yeah. So, so why a mongoose? Why a mongoose, yeah. I don't know. And I feel like as well, if I was a poltergeist, I like I wouldn't choose a mongoose to possess. I'd probably choose something much cooler. Like a pair of sunglasses? Yes. Or <laughs> like a lion. Although a lion would struggle to live in your walls, but not the point. And you'd also struggle to find a lion in the Isle of Man. I think uh, it's, it's about what's available, isn't it? I why think. go to the Isle of Man then? Why not go somewhere cooler? Well, what if he was already in the Isle of Man? Oh, that's a very good point. Yeah. Theory number three. Jim Irving created Jeff. Years after his initial assertion that Jeff was indeed a poltergeist, Fodor changed his mind and hypothesised that Jeff was a split off part of Jim's personality in order to fill his time, build his ego and feed the mental starvation which he suffered in the wilderness of the island. I think that's probably the strongest one yet. I don't think it's the right one. I think think if it's going to be generated, it's more likely to come from him than it is from the kid. I think it's definitely the strongest one, but I also think... I just kind of want there to be a talking mongoose because I think it's hilarious. Yeah. But you I, know. Think, I think if it's going to come from anybody, it's going to come from an adult, I think, rather than a child. Because I just don't think, with all the best well in the world, I just don't think the kid's got the like ambition to keep it going that long. Well, she and said... And also, I think the parents realise pretty quick if it's the kid. Like, it might take, you know, a couple of months or whatever, but eventually they're going to notice it's the kid. So, Voyery said in an interview, she was like, I... Like, Jeff was 100% real. It really, really happened. And she said, I wish that my dad had never told anybody about it. But he was so invested in it. So she said in the interview that her dad was the one that was driving, having it investigated. He was the one that was telling people. He was obsessed with, with the idea of Jeff. So, I don't know. I think I mean, that holds weight. Is that the last one? So no, nope, I've oh, got okay. one more to go. Yeah, see, that holds weight for me, I think, out of the three so far. I don't think it's like, it's got a lot of poltergeist behaviour, but I don't think it's a poltergeist because it doesn't make sense, the whole mongoose thing to me, if I'm thinking about it in like a paranormal brain mindset. It, it's it got some sort of elements to it being the kid, but I just don't, I don't, I don't feel like it is. I feel like she's actually, you know, she, there's more stuff going on than that. Whereas if it was coming from dad. Well, when you think about it, so if you think about the Enfield haunting and there's like all that video evidence of the ghost talking through Janet, which, you know, we know is, it, I'm I'm going to call it out and say it was a hoax as we did in the episode. I think you did. You, I did, you didn't. But she, the way that she speaks or the way that the ghost speaks is very much akin to the, verbosity of a 12 year old or whatever she was yeah. whereas this this ghost is like i'll split the atom i'm the eighth wonder of the world i am god of all the dimensions like that's very kind of we also have evidence within the story that the dad could make animal sounds as well because he was doing it with him when he found him in the oh yeah so 
that kind of leads into it. I wonder about that split in the atom thing though, because I wonder how like in popular knowledge that was. Because we were, we were we were a long way off it being the Manhattan Project being revealed, and that's definitely something they would have been working on in secret. So, I mean, it could be one of those things where potentially that has been added in afterwards. Yeah, or you know, it could be something, something that, that is in common science thought in that it could be done, but we don't know how to do it. Yeah, potentially. I.e. we can space travel, but we're not quite there yet. Theory number four. The most obvious one. And I'm a very big fan of Occam's Razor. The most obvious explanation is generally it. Jeff the Mongoose was actually an evolutionarily advanced mongoose. I mean, when you put it like that, it sounds ridiculous. <laughs> what this is my strongest theory how dare you i think i think it's just you using the big words if you just said the most obvious theory was jeff is a talking mongoose that would make more sense but if you're saying it's some kind of evolutionary wonder that's suggesting it's a bit more of a big scale than it is what if it was a possessed mongoose so what if it was the spirit of jeff who used to live on the isle of man in the 1800s or was even on that ship that brought the mongoose over and died on the way over bother possessing a mongoose well what if that's the only thing you can do that's, but that's it. That is what you do as a ghost. You possess a mongoose and throw stuff at a family. Oh, that is very boring. It's the difference between possessing something and being able to have an impact or just being there. And, and I mean, he did. I have to say, Jeff the Mongoose had a massive impact. It was all over newspapers at the time. Like, word genuinely spread of this talking mongoose. And it just, when he gets to carry on, like, maybe he was, like, really looking forward to arriving back at home to the Isle of Man from India because he was a sailor. And they were bringing some mongoose over. And then he died on the journey home. And like the nearest thing to him when he died was a mongoose. So he jumped on the mongoose just so that he could, you know, catch up with his mates and go to market. You know, and then and then actually he ended up being quite aggressive because it wasn't quite what he was expecting from his afterlife. I have to say, if I died and my afterlife was to possess a mongoose, I'd be, I would be surprised. Yeah, but then you might be, for the first bit. And annoyed. Yeah, like but I'd for be the annoyed. first bit you might be, oh, this is all right, actually. And actually Don't know if I would. Well, because it's better than just being dead, isn't it? Just being nothing. Well, the thing is, if you're nothing, at least you don't know you're nothing. But if you're a mongoose, you know you're a mongoose. But do you this not know you're nothing? This is the weirdest though? episode we've done in a really long time. Do you not know you're nothing? That's the question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's a. He's, I don't think he's an evolutionary marvel. Although there's, I feel, I feel like there's a lot of lore about mongoose being quite, you know, spiritual. So maybe he was just. Maybe didn't we just talk to? to tap in a bit. Didn't we talk to Rowana about that? So when we did our Patreon episode with Rowana, we talked about otters being very prevalent in folklore. Yeah, we did. Otters so it are might very be... different to mongoose. Yeah, I know, but it might be in like the same family. You know? Uh, did you know that ferrets can suffer from depression? There's I think a ferrets fact. are closer to to mongoose than mm. otters are. Yeah, yeah, just like ferrets. My nanny used to keep ferrets. So maybe. Maybe he was. Maybe he just tapped into something because they made the effort to communicate. What we need is we need someone with a pet mongoose to start experiments. Yeah. So start by making different animal sounds. Yeah. If after a period of time of you improvise, improvising, impersonating a cow, a goat, a duck, a platypus, um, you start to get some responses that sound familiar, then you won't need to move on to nursery rhymes. Yeah, that's the next logical step, yeah. If he starts, or if the mongoose starts to be able to sing the nursery rhymes back, then start asking questions, and hopefully he will have gained the language ability to be able to communicate with you. However, you must be warned at this point, if you do undertake this experiment, we are not responsible for any angry and destructive mongoose behaviour that occurs after this experiment. Yeah, we we can't be held accountable for that, I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what are you deciding? What Uh, theory are you going for? Okay, so... I am very disappointed in myself because I am leaning towards theory three. Me too. And I'm disappointed that it's that I, I mean, think I, it's theory three. I'm shocked that you're three. disappointed because you always spoil well, because everything. <laughs> I know I ruin everything for everybody out there. But I, I like loved this story when I was a kid. And when I was a kid, I was like, wow, animals can talk. And then, you know, I, I've kind of, a lot of my mind has been occupied by Jeff the Mongoose. Yeah. You know, a bizarre amount, some might say. And I'm glad we finally get to talk about it. And I desperately want Jeff to be a talking magical mongoose. I feel like this episode is a little bit like a um, a, a bottleneck in um, our mental consciousness from being in lockdown for over a month. Yeah, potentially. <laughs> that, that might be it, yeah. <laughs> but I thoroughly enjoyed it because I like the idea that there might be a talking mongoose out there somewhere. 
Well, no, he's... Well, the man who shot the talking mongoose, shot the talking mongoose and then kept the corpse, there, they showed Voiri a picture and she was like, that's not even a mongoose. Oh, is that what she said? <laughs> yeah. Oh. She was just like, that's A, not Jeff, and B, that's not even a mongoose. <laughs> I killed the mongoose, so that's a rabbit. Yeah. It's, uh-huh. it's it's Jeff as a rabbit. Yes, he was in rabbit form. I mean, I, like, honestly, Maybe that man is being terrorised by Jeff and just doesn't want to let people know. And so he's tried to do this to get people off the scent. And oh, he's maybe. like, I, I killed him. He was... A, yes. Maybe. Are you ready for some reviews? Or maybe, one last thing, maybe he killed something that he wasn't supposed to kill. So maybe he like, shot a manx cat who was protected or something like that. And then he was and like, like, oh, it's, oh, it's Jeff the Mongoose. Jeff, Jeff the Mongoose. <laughs> so he just adds some fur or yeah. paints it or something, make it look a bit stranger. <laughs> Review number one comes from The Other Sparks. Dan and Emma's chemistry is fantastic and I love the way that they infuse creepy stories with humour. They have definitely made my nightly walks around our rural neighbourhood more interesting. Forget this being one of our favourite podcasts about the paranormal or comedy or whatever. This is one of the best podcasts I've discovered in some time, period. Oh, thank you very much. I can't even imagine listening to us walking around a dark rural village. (laughs) And number two comes from Stevie G, who said it's the cat's pyjamas. Stephen Gerrard? Oh, wow. This is not the first time Stevie G's name has come up on this podcast and we make the same joke every time. Oh, do we? Much like the bee's knees, but better. Emma and Dan, can't forget Bim, are the cat's pyjamas. Not only do they give a wonderful variety of topics of all things spooky and spectacular, but they also give you relatable, witty banter that will make you laugh out loud. Prepare to be opened up to a whole new world beyond the typical ghost, poltergeisty stories. I mean, you can definitely say that today. A world where skinwalkers, black-eyed children, yaoi's, and much, much more lurk among us. Be warned, they set the bar very high and make other porn out... <laughs> The pornographies. Other pornography seem dull. <laughs> Other paranormal podcasts seem dull. Once you start, you won't be able to get enough. Much love and respect, Stephen Gerrard. <laughs> Thanks, Stevie G. Thanks, Steve. And B-G. finally, Kitty Kitty Pow Pow. I've been listening for a while, but could not remember my iTunes password. We've all been there, babe. Finally, I get to give these amazing people the review they deserve. Even if I'm not 100% sure this is my account or belongs to someone else in my family. (laughs) It is such a funny podcast in a relatable way. It's the kind of podcast that makes you feel like you're sitting with a couple of friends. Keep being great from Evie. Thank you all so much. This, I'm sorry this episode was maybe not as spooky as you were hoping for because it's it's a very strange episode. I mean, if you think of it in context and you take away all the stuff that we spoke, a, a talking mongoose that throws stuff and swears is quite scary. And can split the atom. Yeah. I mean, that is a great power to have. And I kind of wanted to to make a bit of light relief this week. Do you know? I wanted something a little bit, just a little bit funny to talk about. And I also fucking love this story. And we've also got, you know, the third member of the crew is actually at the table recording with us. Yeah, <laughs> so big news. Bim is literally sitting at the table with us. She never does that. I don't know what's going on. Oh. So Dan had to move his general podcast recording position because Bim has decided to sit at the table and record with us so i have a really lovely um comfortable chair that i sit in to work on however because of the the order of the table when we're recording emma gets that chair so i i I cope by having another chair which has got a cushion on it which makes the wooden chair slightly more comfortable however this week no i'm not even on that no (laughs) so i am at the bottom of the scale at the moment i tell you if you enjoyed this week's episode you can find us on Instagram at Real Life Ghost Stories. You can find Dan on Instagram at 50p Movie Club. You can find us on Twitter at Real Ghost Pod. You can find us on Facebook, Real Life Ghost Stories Podcast. Give our page a like, leave a little review on Facebook if you feel so inclined, and join our supergroup, which is R L G S Supergroup, and the password is Emma and Dan. If you would like to send us in your creepy ghost story or an episode recommendation, whatever you like, you can send it to real life ghost stories podcast at gmail.com. Got it done now. Yeah, well done. Thanks. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, you can do so patreon.com forward slash real life ghost stories, where for five dollars a month you get access to an extra spooky episode per week. And for two dollars a month, what do you get? You get access to the full bat, the bat catalogue. Yeah. The full catalogue of bats. Yes. Hmm. Uh, no, the full back catalogue of something called 50p Movie Club, 
which is a little side project that I have uh, done in the past with Will and I'm currently doing with Mr. David Keane um, where we watch really bad movies and we chat about them and we have fun in general. And if you want to buy some merch or subscribe to our YouTube channel, the links are in the description. And on that note, we shall see you next week. Bye.